No one's here. Fuck off. <laughs> okay. Well, you asked for it. I respect Sekiro. From Software deserves a lot of credit for trying to evolve the Soulsborne format. Offering either stealth or swordplay, it pulls back from the overwhelming choice you get from Dark Souls and Bloodborne's numbers-heavy character progression in favour of a smaller array of choices. This demands that the player engage with all of it and get better. The agility which Wolf has is a wonder to behold. The world is gorgeous and vibrant, colourful despite the rot undercutting its tail. Hell, the player can jump now. You can jump, you can jump. jump. I feel like you, can jump. Jump. But you have but you have nothing to do it. You can jump. It again. Boy, listen. This ain't a jump. Not in the way I mean. It's barely a trip. The Chosen Undead needs to sprint for a good bit to get to this heavy hop. And even then, you can only go forwards, not up. Not to mention that it feels like you've got a sword up your arse when you do it. But I'd be struggling if I said I loved Sekiro. I think it's a masterclass in game design. I think it's a fantastic game, but my favourite From Software title? Not even close. The fact that everything, save a few bosses, is built around the parry system means that you don't have that freedom of making your character your own, which is so invigorating in titles like these. You're one character, with one sword, one set of armour, go and get good. And whilst this lends to a really strong, cultivated experience, it's the From Software game I've replayed the least. Now my girlfriend didn't want to play Sekiro. Can't see you, it's fine. I can't see you from my ponytail. Oh, fuck! <laughs> Back when it released, she saw me battle the demon of hatred, so this is her only exposure to the game. A spectacle boss, which is frustrating to fight because it undermines so much of the game's design. Parrying isn't the priority here, dodging is. Instead, she wanted to play Dark Souls 3. But unfortunately for her, my patrons had other ideas. Thanks guys. So with her previous ventures into Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne's openings under her belt, I figured it was about time to put Sekiro's supposedly more intuitive first section to the test, to analyse how it teaches a noob, a non-gamer, namely my girlfriend, its systems. We spent longer on Sekiro than we have on any of the previous games. The rules were simple. Number one, I wouldn't play any of the game for her, she was on her own. Number two, I wouldn't be a backseat gamer. And number three, she could take as many breaks as she liked, but her goal was to get past the game's first real challenge, the Chained Ogre. All of this with the purpose of answering one important question. Nubis Humanis 3. Can my girlfriend get past the Chained Ogre in Sekiro? Let me repeat, you asked for this. Strong language ahead. Is not cold enough. Sekiro is the most hands-on game in the series, both in how it teaches the player and how it weaves its story. Our opening cutscene isn't necessarily about the world or laying a framework for any fantastical elements we will see, it's all about Wolf, Ishin Ashina, the Owl, the fateful battle which sewed these three pivotal characters together. The backdrop of a real historical war grounds the violence of the world. You are a shinobi. You're going to feel like a shinobi playing it. The Nubis didn't know that the shinobi were real agents in Japan, so she started referring to Wolf as... I am a master shinobi. Problematic? Maybe. Forgivable, I guess. She'd received her second COVID-19 vaccination earlier that day, so she was a little loopy while playing, but this continued through a lot of her playtime. Shinobi. Kenobi. Open your eyes. Her experience with Dark Souls and Bloodborne lent a lot of natural expectations to how Sekiro would control, but there was still an overwhelming amount of information for her to swallow. Although, to the game's credit, she spent so little time reading important items she got, like, the literal scroll which told her what to do! But her first stumbling block was the wall hug. Toggle ward, well jump. So what, like, let's like practice on you first. I still don't understand what this means. What does it mean? What does it mean? I don't know. I've never had to. Yeah, 
Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and despite her desperation for a sneak mechanic in the previous two games, it took a lot of practice for her to get used to it. It's, oh no, oh no, oh no, I'm dead already. Ah, I can't help, I can't help. Just run, just run, just run, just run, just run, 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 run. Oh my god. Well, it's okay. <laughs> She was really anal about her speed of movement. For the first hour or so, she would gently nudge the analog stick forward so she wouldn't rustle the grass too much, terrified that enemies would hear her, and at numerous points throughout her playthrough, she'd panic at the slightest nudge from Wolf. Shh. Shh. She's not shushing me or the budgies there, she's shushing the game. I think it's a testament to how different Sekiro's game feel is that despite spending an easy 20 hours in Bloodborne and Dark Souls combined, she fell into a lot of the initial trappings of a day one Nubis. All of the new tactics like the wall jump, the stealth, the plethora of items you receive, and even the storyline just drowned her senseless. On numerous occasions, she'd remark, This is... too much. Oh, and then the game crashed. We were off to a great start. A brief reset and a cup of tea later, she took a deep breath and started to really focus on what the game was telling her. Her volume dropped 10 decibels. A small frown crossed her face, mumbling and muttering to herself, and to my surprise, she started to take the game seriously. In the safety of Kuro's tower, she experimented with the menu and items, getting a further understanding of how item management worked, but that's when our second roadblock appeared. Yeah. Can I not hold it? Dark Souls and Bloodborne had conditioned her to anticipate new weapons, new armour, which she could swap in and out of. You might remember this is one of the things she legitimately loved about Dark Souls during her first attempt. We were here for a fair few minutes before she decided to just brace the outside world and see if combat would happen. And to her surprise, it did. This became her strategy for her entire time with the game. Just like always, jumping in, getting a quick kill, and then retreating was the plan, but unlike Dark Souls and Bloodborne, Sekiro regularly stops the game, regardless of what you're doing, and slaps a sticky note on the screen to give you some helpful guidance and advice. Personally, after the saga we all had to go through when she didn't stop to receive weapons from the messengers in Bloodborne, I thought this would be something she'd appreciate. The game is telling you how to play it. There's no room for nuance or interpretation, no way you could get lost with its combat. But... Yeah, I know. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Also, I hate that that comes up, like, during fights. Did this bother anyone else? I remember personally being quite thankful that Sekiro unambiguously spelled this out to me when I played, but the Nubis, boldened by her previous experience, was just annoyed by it. Which then meant that when she accidentally achieved a perfect parry and the red glistening orb of death appeared encouraging her to finish off her foe, she was baffled and confused by it, generously giving the soldier a few more minutes to live. I'll just stay light on my feet. That'll be fine. <laughs> But her confidence grew and grew, forcing through deaths 3 and 4, until she felt confident enough to empty the starting area of all her foes. There were no shouts of glee, not like before, just a deathly serious tone sweeping over the living room. Quiet mumbles to herself which I couldn't hear. Oh, except for... Hiya. Holy shit! Fucking getting it. <laughs> Eventually, she reached leader Shigenori Yamauchi, her first official mini boss, but before their swords could clash, another one of these tutorial messages appeared. She considered it, read it at length, twice, preparing herself for battle. Her parry game was relatively strong at first, a quick one two like a drunken boxer. Not especially skilled, but her silent enthusiasm carried her into her first mini boss death blow. Her caution, her attempts to read him, it's still impressive to watch. Let's get behind this tree. <laughs> oh, okay, I see. 
Well, <laughs> okay. We were here for an hour, so here's a montage. A grim silence again as she killed the leader, just the sketch of a smile crawling up her face. I couldn't quite tell if she was beginning to enjoy herself yet, or if she was holding on to that sadistic satisfaction we'd seen before, ready to let it rock it out later. She swiftly made it to the end of the tutorial and summoned Kuro with a reed whistle, and as the divine heir approached, she looked at me and, with a look of pain on her face, asked, Am I gonna have to, like, escort him for the whole game? And it was then that something dawned on me. Anubis has played games, but she's never had to endure the pain of an honest-to-god escort mission. She's never experienced Metal Gear Solid 2, never had to shepherd Ashley Graham through Spain. I had a fleeting thought that maybe that would make an entertaining video, but no, no, I I'm not that cruel. I'll leave her to From Software for now. Anyway, her experience with Genoshiro was brief. Look, he's got a big fucking bow and arrow. It's too big for him. Where is he? There he is. You oh, for fuck. I'm supposed to lose this, right? That's no, the thing. No, you're not. No! Well. <laughs> he just cut off my arm! <laughs> if this isn't Star Wars, I don't know what is. <laughs> Nobody didn't have his arm chopped off, did he? No. No. Is that what a dick! <laughs> she know me. <laughs> the divine heir will come in with me. Yeah, I think you should go with him, kid. He fucking knows what he's doing! In her defence, I don't think I lasted much longer on my first playthrough. Hakuna Matara. What a wonderful... What, why has this reminded you of Hakuna Matata? Because Timon and Pimba says... Simba. We were coming towards the end of the night. The Covid jab was clearly beginning to take its toll on her. She was feverish and apparently hallucinating meerkats and fucking warthogs in a game about Japan. We decided to call it there, with the tutorial conquered and the real game just beginning. Is that a cock -cock? It's not gonna attack me, is it? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> The next day, the Nubis was feeling much better. The after effects of the vaccination seemed to have worn off. She guzzled a couple of Red Bulls and we were back in the game. She ventured out of the dilapidated temple into the ashen outskirts, and it was here she began to get a really solid feel for how quick and agile Sekiro can make its player feel. She kept referring to Wolf as Spider-Man, all thoughts of Obi-Wan Shinobi and the Lion King lost from her mind, but Sekiro's verticality meant that the level design in its newfound complexity started to confuse her. Where Dark Souls and Bloodborne provided simple roads and paths to follow, shortcuts and secrets buried in a more linear way, Sekiro's world feels so vast and open that it's incredibly exciting but it also means that a first-time player is likely to ask one of the most common questions in gaming. Where the fuck do I go? Oh no. Oh no, that's a boss. No, 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 no. I'm not here. I'm not here. <laughs> Ooh, you're so mad. They can't get me because I'm all the way up here. But she did really enjoy the fact that she could, at a whim, skip difficult enemies and optional mini-bosses littered throughout the map. 
Her combat experience suffered as a result, but it's definitely one of the ways Sekiro provides agency to a player. I'd argue that the game makes it very easy to skip over half of its content if you wish. Any chance she got, she'd stay high up, clambering over scaffoldings and zipping about, cleverly using vantage points to survey enemies before charging in, but all of her surveillance didn't stop her panicking and snapping whenever she was under threat. Hey. I feel like I could take you. Is that a bad idea? <laughs> oh shit, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Stop, Susan. Can you hear it? The Nubis rage, I can feel it in my bones. Now initially this looks like a death, but I haven't rung the bell because it's here we unlock one of Sekiro's most interesting mechanics, the resurrection system. This is both Sekiro's lore-based justification for enemies respawning after meditating, but also Sekiro's clever way of giving a purely optional out for players, despite its high skill ceiling. It's still insane to me how someone can be so good at the game that they can choose to ignore this mechanic altogether to increase the difficulty. This time, rather than use Resurrection to fight back at the troll that mashed her into the snow, the Nubis used it to escape, and frantically dashed forwards into a wrecked house. Getting the young lord's bell charm, she opted to retreat. What happened? Did you go back? Yeah, I went back. I Did got a bell. No. Yeah, you got a bell? Cool. I got a bell, and then there was a lot of men around, and so I was like, nah. Now that is impressive. I think that the shuriken prosthetic being planted so close to the old woman is here to encourage a player to complete the surrounding area, collect the bell from her, reach the next meditation point, and then return to the sculptor. The Nubis didn't reach the next meditation point, but it says something about her understanding of these games and their intuitive design that she knew she collected enough items that it was time to return to the previous NPC. Now despite the sculptor not telling her to bother the Buddha, she decided to do just that. But being teleported to this new uncharted territory, she took a big gulp and booped out of there, planning to explore the ashen outskirts instead and improve at the combat. Just look at it, it looks so pretty. Like it's a lot brighter than all the other games. It's just, I don't know, it's nice. I also really like the jump. I do really like the jump. Now this is something I've regularly heard by Sekiro's biggest fans. The game is gorgeous, it's bright, there's something truly captivating about Sekiro's colour more than any of the other From Software games. The torches seem to have a saturated brightness to them, the blossoms in the lake later in the game languish in how pretty they can be. Oh, there's another one! For fuck's sake, it's just riddled, guys! But it also meant that the Nubis wasn't as interested in Sekiro's world. She thought it was nice, her words, not fascinating. She found the enemy variety lacking. She was beginning to miss how overtly magical Dark Souls was with its dragons and its lightning gods and even Bloodborne's horror of all things. Because she wasn't fighting monsters or undead things, the gore actually began to make her a little grossed out. She was stabbing people in the neck, real people, real soldiers, and to her that wasn't necessarily enthralling, it was just a bit queasy. And she's not someone easily grossed out either. I wasn't expecting this reaction from her, she's a big fan of a good horror film, but something about how visceral Sekiro's combat was discouraged her from playing it. Is that... What? Where? Who? <laughs> The roosters, though, she could kill them over and over again. Oh, has he got a bow and arrow? Oh, fuck. Oh, it's not even a bow and arrow. That's worse. Well. Oh, and the gunmen too, but maybe she just still hated them after Bloodborne. The bastards. Her lack of aggression was what kept coming up again and again. She really didn't want to leap into the thrall of enemies. She'd trip down, get a couple of hits in, then retreat up into a nearby tower. She was so eager to get revenge on the huge troll that mashed her face before though. He's clearly positioned here to prepare the player for the chained ogre just over the ridge. A big, heavy hitter that doesn't encourage parrying but instead leaping and dodging to take down. Flashbacks of Bloodborne's trolls returned to her during their second face-off, and she even forgot how some of the controls worked. No, that's not what I wanted. It's not what I wanted either! Oh my god, how did I swing again? I can't remember. No, stop, stop it. Is it because I'm locked onto him? 
Is that what it is? No, that's not what I wanted. Oh my god, can you fucking stop it? Oh. <laughs> but eventually, she made it to the big boy. Eavesdropping on the two soldiers, she picked up on their hint that fire would take the heaving son of a bitch down. And before we knew it, it was time for her boss. Look, fire. Ooh, scary fire. Ooh, scary fire. You don't care. You don't care. I can't even lock onto him because I'm not anywhere near him. Come here! <laughs> yeah! Get <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. This is where I broke one of my rules. The Nubis was clearly becoming disinterested with the game, and I didn't want to watch her bash her head against the chained ogre another ten times before rage quitting, so I told her about the flame barrel. For anyone who hasn't played Sekiro, you can find and equip a flamethrower to your prosthetic, which lets you shoot fire at enemies which are weak to it, like the ogre. I told her quite clearly to go back in time to that new area you could reach after bringing the bell to the sculptor and that the flame barrel was waiting for her there near a campfire. She took that advice, but not before Emma the physician told her all about the dragon rot. Okay. I still haven't came across any fucking beans that she wanted. What did she want? Not beans. Seeds! <laughs> 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 Once the Nubis arrived at the Harata estate, she was left to her own devices. That same slow, methodical gameplay we'd seen before continued here. Despite being able to swim beneath the bridge leading up to the war zone, she opted to cross the bridge, presumably not realising that she could swim. Shit, shit, dogs, shit, dogs, dogs, shit, 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 get the double jump, fuck it. <laughs> oh, fuck, fuck, fuck! <laughs> The uh, trauma of Bloodborne's dogs made her immediately fearful of Sekiro's hounds. Despite complaining that she was fighting dudes with swords, any new enemy types made her lose her mind. But despite her initial panic, she held her own, eventually making it to the next shrine. The level design isn't the only thing which disincentivized direct combat for her. The fact that the game offered the option to skip the majority of encounters was how she found a lot of her fun, opting to plan around enemy pathing to sneak up on enemies. Right, I'm gonna wait till this guy gets over here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna kill him. And now I'll leave me with two guys in this wee section. She started to audibly vocalise her intentions, testing how they sounded, how they felt, the fact that the game had taken her by the hand in its opening hour, describing in laborious detail how the swordplay worked, made her stop thinking… creatively. She would either sneak by baddies or hack at them with her sword, so many of the useful items she found, like attack or defence boosts, fell by the wayside, where Dark Souls and Bloodborne were so open and ambiguous that it forced a player to feel their way into a specific playstyle, magic, dodging, guarding, or a reliance on projectile items, the Nubis saw Sekiro as having one way to play. This meant that picking up items didn't feel mystical and exciting, but actively annoying. There's so many things. Is there this many things in Dark Souls? Which might explain why she was so unprepared for what came next. Look at that guy just scratching his back with his big axe. Yeah. That's what I'd do if I had a big axe. Is that guy asleep? Can I hear snoring? Oh fuck. You didn't see me, I'm crouching. shouldn't be able to- Oh fuck! See me! Oh fuck! Nope! Oh no, they didn't see! They saw me. They saw me. They all saw me. Oh no. Where's the thing? Well, fuck to now, didn't I? Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? I didn't realise they were guys! I thought they were statues! Well. Eventually, making it into the campsite, she spotted the ominous campfire, a thick billow of smoke standing out to guide the player's eyeline to where an important item might be waiting. With my advice in her ear, she guessed that the glowing item next to this thick flame was the flamethrower I previously mentioned. She remained up high, fully believing the enemies wouldn't look up, whether she was crouching or not. Fine. Oh, you didn't see me. She opted to just dash into the campsite, grab the item and dash away. She came for one thing and one thing only and nothing, not gunmen, not drunk soldiers, not dogs, were going to get in her way. 
A successful, if not clumsy, run later, she continued her charge out to the campsite, past the bridge and shield enemies, and returned to where she was most comfortable, up high and out of sight. She was ready to leave by this point, but spotting Shinobi Hunter and Shin of Misen, I ushered her to stay in the pass just a little bit longer with a promise that it would be worth it. Great. I hate... Okay, that's ah, well, I mean, it was worth it for us. What should have been a respectable stealth kill was interrupted by yet another tutorial message appearing in the heat of the moment, mid-flow. The Nubis continued to be frustrated by Sekiro's insistence on interrupting the rhythm of combat with tutorial message after tutorial message, so in her frustration, she skipped by it, not reading about the importance of Mikuri counters, a tactic which would have been useless to her anyway as she hadn't gained enough skill points to buy it. She spent a lot of this fight asking, Can I not no. Spider-Man or no. Penithin? No? The surrounding cliff sides didn't offer up any opportunities to get above her enemy, a tactic she had consistently relied on during all of her playtime. With her armed with the flame barrel, you'd think constantly retreating wouldn't be a part of her strategy going into the chained ogre. You would be wrong. Oh no! Okay. <laughs> 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 Returning to the ogre, the Nubis missed two vital parts to this boss's strategy. The first was that she would stand patiently, like a granny waiting for a bus, while the ogre roared and broke free of his restraints, rather than going straight in for a few free hits at the beginning. The second was that despite all of that hard work getting the flame barrel itself, she didn't use it, opting to conserve ammunition for when she got good. Her approach remained consistent, at least. Rather than dodging the ochre or parrying his kicks, she thought that the best approach was to hop away whenever he attacked. She started to hastily mumble, I am the gas hopper. <laughs> Taking little bites out of you. I am the gas hopper! Oh no, fuck! <laughs> Eventually she fell into a drunken dance. She'd hop about, getting little cuts in here and there, until eventually the ogre grabbed her and drained her of her health. She'd resurrect, then she'd retreat up this tree, stoic and safe, in the middle of the battlefield, healed, and watch the ogre for a good five minutes, scouting him out, mustering the courage to dive back in. Uh -oh. Where are you going? <laughs> oh, bye! Come around this way. Come, come around this way. <laughs> Where is he? It's fucked up. Shite. <laughs> Despite her frustrations with the ogre, she at least appreciated that she was finally fighting something a bit more fantastical. But mechanically, she kind of hated it, and I don't blame her. Sekiro is an excellent game, don't get me wrong, but the Chained Ogre is a bullshit boss for bullshit people. The grabbing hitboxes in this fight are worse than some of Dark Souls 2's worst moments. The entire game, up until now, has conditioned the player to rely on parrying and careful swordplay to overcome the odds, but the majority of the ogre's attacks are unblockable grabs which a magnetically suck you into his grasp even if you're nowhere near him, and b often kill the player in just one hit. So far, this is the only From Software game where I've heard the Nubis say But that was unfair. And yeah, some of these deaths are unfair. If being grabbed isn't enough, the ogre can catapult you off the edge of the ledge. There's always an understanding with a From Software boss that if you died, it was often your fault. But the Nubis stopped mumbling, I deserved that, and soon started to, for the first time ever, see the flaws. Like how the ogre just twists his entire hitbox towards you without needing to move his feet. No, 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 no. Oh, he's so janky. Janky, 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 janky. And because of this, after an easy 15 hours in the game, the Nubis stopped appreciating the ogre as a boss. Not in the same way she appreciated the Cleric Beast or the Taurus Demon. 
This wasn't the frustration of loss, it was the frustration of a new player who felt like the game was being unfair. And yes, you could argue that she spent a lot of those 15 hours avoiding combat and using the stealth mechanics and mastering her parry, and not much time examining the useful items or testing her skill against the troll with the hammer. This isn't necessarily a criticism of Sekiro as a game, but it is interesting that Sekiro's skill ceiling is so high that someone who legitimately likes Dark Souls a lot and reluctantly respects Bloodborne didn't enjoy Sekiro's opening. And before you start Sekiro fans, remember, you asked for this. We were with the Ogre for a long time. A long time. So here's a rundown of how the rest of this went. Okay, come on in. Oh! oh no, fuck! Stop trying to kick me! It's Ritz! Let's regroup, 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 regroup. Let's go, let's go. Up we go. Well, it was, it was nice. It was nice while it lasted. Yeah, go on, walk away. Ah! Don't like fighting up here. I don't know why I'm up here. <laughs> well. Alright, let's be cautious little grasshopper, shall we? Shite. Oh no. No! What the fuck, man? This guy's nothing! Nothing! Just fucking die. And just walk off the edge. Oh. <laughs> I can't kill any of these. I'm still going. I can't believe I'm still going. How am I still going? Where is he? I'm so shite. <laughs> Absolutely shite. Fuck. Okay, don't throw me off the edge. Don't throw me off it. Fucking block. You get. Well. And then eventually, I had to drag her away from it. It wasn't necessarily an addiction I saw, it was a maddening frustration. She began to forget what buttons did what. I was witnessing the definition of insanity firsthand, and it went past the point of fun. After 41 deaths, she put the controller down, went outside to stretch her legs, had another cup of tea, and decided she was going to give it one more try. This is the result. Did I just mess? Yeah. Wow. Good, okay. good, start good start attempt. Good, 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 good. Love it. Everyone loves an underdog. That's what I am. Oh fuck. Oh fuck! <laughs> right, let's go away. <laughs> no, it's not what I wanted to do. Thank you. No, not doing too sharp on this one. <laughs> oh my god! Right, okay. You got it. Uh, do I? I don't know if I do. No. Up the butt. Oh, fuck me, man. I'm not doing too great. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to do. Oh my god. Well. Great, I have no healing items. No pellets? Uh, maybe, I don't know yet. Yeah, do it. Let's do it. Where is he? Oh, he's over there. How do I do fire again? Like that. That's how I do it. Get up.
was almost the answer. Well. Oh well. So, there you have it. Personally, I'm just impressed she got to the ogre. She gave it more than a fair try, and in the time between that last go and recording this video, she hasn't had an itch to jump back in like she did with the others. But, interestingly, it looks like the tables have turned, with the score sitting at Nubis 2, from Software, 1. Um, okay, well seeing as you didn't do very well in this one, I didn't. Um, to cheer you up, yeah. um, I will let you pick the next one. You know which one I'm going to pick. You have three options. You know which one I'm going to pick. You have either Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, or when we do this next, it's very likely I'll have a PS5, so you'll be able to do Demon Souls. Because we're not going to do another one for a while. I think you're a bit knacked. I with am them. a bit knacked. <laughs> um, so that's your I just your want option. a nice game to play. <laughs> <laughs> I just want a nice game to play. So what's your choice? Dark Souls 3. Dark Souls 3? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for watching. We are currently in the middle of mortgage madness while we move in together, so there's going to be a long wait until Dark Souls 3. Thanks in advance for being so patient. But next month, if all goes well, I should have a feature-length critique of Control coming out. If you liked what you saw, consider subscribing, and as always, take care. This video is made possible by my incredible $2 patrons. Your support is getting us closer and closer to a half-decent rig, so future videos can look and sound as good as they should. Thank you to Ihor May, Jonathan Lum, Jaker, Roblo42, Akela, Thomas Banchak, Eddie Wingforce, Reese Newton Seely, Nicholas Here, Cakesters, Strupp, Angry Optimist, Plog Doctor, Adriana Martinez, Shiftry, Jana Grasfrau, Chris, Armin Leonhard, Jake Klusovitz, Croa Toen, Long Cheddar, Jordan Halsey, Amory Selden, DB Geek, Ryan Smith, Rasmus Nemvaltz, Toxter, Donis Conva, 100 Sams, Neil Dudgeon, why are there so many of you? Michael Diaz, Bob the Mighty 5454, Dinkin Pearson, Kyle Piers, Christopher McKinnon, Seb Scott, Lonely Ronin, Crisp Bread, Zephyr Don, Kane Highwind, Neve Care, and Johnny Miller.